This video was recorded in front of a live virtual audience. Hi everybody, Jacob here. Welcome back to the fragrant, essentially Jacob fashion perfume bunker. <laughs> Today we're going to uh, be reviewing Vol de Nuit by Guerlain. I got a brand new formulation of it in Eau de Toilette concentration and the um, 07701 is the formulation code while the batch number is 1D01. This is a very, very classic Guerlain fragrance. Before we spray it, I'ma say it, subscribe to my channel here on YouTube. You can also become a member and a patron of my main channel, my main Super Jacob channel, which helps sustain the perfume channel as well. So thank you to all my members and patrons who have already pledged. This video is being filmed live in front of a live virtual audience. So all of y'all guys who are in the live chats, thank you so much for co-reviewing this perfume with me. You too can um, join me every Saturday on my main channel in my live streams where I pre-record all of these videos live so you can also be in the chats and partake in the reviews of these fragrances. So now, haha, -ha, let's spritz away. Okie dokie. So, woo. we're in the 30s, you guys. This is pre-Second World War Europe. 1933 is the year of release of Vol de Nuit in pure perfume form, first and foremost. Eau de Toilette came a little bit later. However, Guerlain still today offers the pure perfume bottle. We're going to get to that in a minute. As we know, with Guerlain, Jacques Guerlain is the nose behind this perfume, while Raymond Guerlain designed the bottle. It's a slightly altered bottle from how it used to look back in the 30s but it's kind of cool that Guerlain went back to this design um feeling the oats of the original design which had the upside down heart with a hole in the middle and then they had the, their little strings going through there now it's a little bit stylized but we have this very 30s type of almost like greek um, column mixed with oriental influences there as well um typical for those years it's not like Guerlain invented this, but it's typical to Guerlain as well. So what is also typical to Guerlain is being part of the poet, literary, artistic intelligentsia or intelligentsia of the time. Walking around in those circles of poets, authors, painters, theater people, um, he was a big fan of a book that uh, Exupéry brought out in 1931. Yes, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry published a book entitled Vol de Nuit, which is exactly the name of this perfume. Just two years before Vol de Nuit was released, okay, Exupéry publishes a book called Vol de Nuit. Exupéry, who also wrote The Little Prince, which is one of the best-selling books of all times, really. But this review is not about The Little Prince. This review is about Vol de Nuit. Vol de Nuit, which means night flight. If we were to li literally translate Vol, flight, de, of, nuit, night. Night flight. So, 1931, Exupéry brings out a book that Guerlain loves, got inspired by. So we get also a little bit of a background information about how long does it really take for a perfume to get developed. Now, I do not know if Jacques Guerlain read the book right upon its release or a little bit later. The book became very popular. It brought a lot of fame to Exupéry. Uh, so maybe Jacques read it half a year after it was released. So the timing that we have for the launch of the fragrance Vol de Nuit is about a year and a half from its original idea of creating a perfume called Vol de Nuit to its launch. So it's a very short amount of time to create a whole perfume 
that would outlive decades and decades and would still be known today. So you can see how quickly uh, perfumers can work when they're given the right tools to do so. Like Jacques Erlan had his own empire back then. So he, it took him a short amount of time. He got the right inspiration, the right mood, and he delivered a mood. Now, let's get quickly to the top notes. We got aldehydes, galbanum. So the galbanum is what makes Voldenui so particular and popular. It's a specific tape on galbanum. Now, um, Voldenui is a Shepra fragrance, but it doesn't have that typical oak mossy bitterness. It, it, it's, it's a slightly more floral, powdery Shepra. It's not your typical Shepra that you kind of associate Shepras with, like Chopin, uh, not Chopin, sorry, Cabocha um, from Madame Gray, or um, Aromatics Elixir, or if we're going to go back more back in time, we can, you know, talk about more historic, typical Shepras that really go into that earthy, green, mossy aspect of oak moss. This is a powdery Shepra, okay? It's more floral and elevated, and the aldehydes elevated quite a bit. So we got aldehydes, galbanum, narcissus, bergamot, orange blossom, lemon, orange, mandarin orange in the top notes, mid notes, iris, narcissus, aldehydes, vanilla, vi vanilla in the mid notes, you guys. Very interesting for Gerlinade not being Gerlinade because the vanilla is not in the bottom. Uh, violet, Indonesian carnation, rose, and jasmine. The aldehydes with the jasmine do deliver a slight delicate and dolic smell, okay? Not too poopy, though, because this one, alas, has been watered down drastically, okay? Base notes, oak moss, orris root, sandalwood, spices, and musk. And we got the the packaging here of the current formulation. In fact, um, it has Evernia furfuracea, aka tree moss extract, listed in the ingredients. So this one, uh, I'll bite being just a, a minimal amount of. Uh, can I zoom this in? I think I can. Okay. There it is. Evernia furfuracea tree moss extract. So I'll bite IFRA regulations being a teeny teensy tiny little bit of oak moss allowed in here. It's still in there. So got to hand it to Guerlain for that. <clears throat> now, however, the perfume in its current state of the toilette formulation, this particular formula doesn't last a minute on your skin. It is so weak that if you think this one is going to last, like people are describing how long it lasts, how long it used to last in the past, that's in the past. Now, if you're getting this, you're going to get a delicate powdery floral Shepra that will last you an hour and then it's gone. So treat this as a very light cologne. Doesn't matter, even as a very light cologne, it is fantastic, it is to die for, but it is also very dated in the 30s, morally speaking. I'm going to get to it. What does that mean? So first, let's to understand this perfume more, we have to understand the book that inspired this fragrance. The, the Antoine de Saint-Exupéry Night Flight or Vol de Nuit book from 1931. Um, now, the novel. The novel is set in Argentina at the outset of commercial aviation. Riviere is the station chief of an airline that is the first to pioneer night flights, disciplining his employees to focus all they do on ensuring that the nails, that the mail gets through punctually each night. The novel's episodic structure is built around um, about his work at the Buenos Aires office and the final hours of, of the pilot Fabien on the Patagonia run. Fabien's plane is caught in a cyclone, runs out of fuel, and loses radio contact, while Rivier tries all he can to locate the aircraft. At stake is the future of the night mail run to Europe. 
Once the two other flights from Chile and Paraguay get through, Riviere has to allow the transatlantic flight to Paris to depart without the missing mail, resigning himself to Fabienne's loss. The narration is spare and much of the action is presented as a thought or mental perception. And this is where we get the inspiration for this perfume. It's not about the action of, of the first time in history that airplanes started flying at night to deliver mail and could start battling this war against ships. Back then only ships could carry mail from the Americas to Europe back and forth. But now you got airplanes that could fly during the day, but the ships would gain a lot of uh, traction because the ships can run also at night, planes couldn't. So night flights in planes back then was something relatively innovative as a concept. So the thought process of the pilots, of the author, of the, of the people in the book is what makes this book so special. It's, it's that thinking about the potential, about the change and about the moral. It's that thought process, as it says here, the narration is spare and much of the action is presented as a thought or mental perception. I think that's the point that inspired Jacques Erlan to create the perfume. In fact, the perfume doesn't smell, okay, of night flight. It doesn't smell of an airplane going through um, dangerous canyons and mountains, flying across oceans and mountains to get... To, no, it's a mental process. It smells of a thought. And it smells of moral. Remember I mentioned this a couple of minutes ago and I said we're going to get to the moral in just a bit? We're Hold on, we're getting there. The final moments of Fabien are experienced in this way just as he has climbed clear of the clouds. And now a wonder sees him, dazzled by that brightness. He had to keep his eyes closed for some seconds. He had never dreamt the night clouds could dazzle thus. But the full moon and all the constellations were changing them to light. In a flash, the very instant he had risen clear, the pilot found a peace that passed his understanding. Not a ripple tilted the plane, but like a ship that has crossed the bar, it moved within a tranquil anchorage. In an unknown secret corner of the sky it floated, as in a harbor of the Happy Isles. Below him still the storm was fashioning another world, riddled with squalls and cloudbursts and lightnings, but turning to the stars a face of crystal snow. Now all grew luminous, his hands, his clothes, the wings, and Fabienne thought that he was in a limbo of strange magic, for the light did not come down from the stars, but welled up from below, from all that snowy whiteness. The sky turns to the ground, the ground to the sky, the snow reflecting the light. There's the smell of snow, which we already encountered in the 20s with Chanel's number five, when the aldehydes were utilized by um, Ernest Beau to create a smell of snow. We have those aldehydes coming back again in the 30s to create a sense of cool and cold air. Vaudenouis gives a cool touch to a smell of a fragrance that is slightly detached and distant, but why? Because the moral comes into play again. And now we're going to get to the moral, a little note that I wrote here in my little booklet. And I said, Voldenui does not smell of the actual concept of early 30s first plane night flights with post, but rather of the integrity, moral, and earnestness of the pilot flying that plane and sacrificing his life for the cause of a noble endeavor, such as delivering letters from South America to Europe and vice versa on a plane. In reality, this sacrifice of human life is a sacrifice for their job. But, and this is interesting, it, it, it's not much of a noble cause for themselves. But it's a sacrifice of a human being for their job and saying, well, I give importance to the capitalistic structure of things. Sure, we can tarnish it through the noble cause of letters. People want their letters or from their loved ones and this and that. Sure, but a lot of those letters are also business letters that just 
help push even more capitalism. So, the point being that I feel that in the novel there's a veiled emphasis on you should sacrifice yourself for your country. And this is pre-Second World War Europe in which this book was written. There's this kind of describing to the people reading, manipulating the people reading to think, yeah, you should sacrifice yourself for a noble cause. Now, what is so noble about sacrificing your life for your job? Well, the trick in this novel is that back then, night flights and flying in general was very romanticized. It was a new concept. So there's this whole poetic aspect of being above the clouds and just giving all your best to deliver news in letter form to people. Um, so, you know, the novel would not have had such a success if it were about um, a person working in a hat shop, millinery, somebody creating hats, sacrificing their life, working double shifts to finish a hat for some rich uh, madame from the neighborhood. You know what I mean? It would lack that poetry, but this is like the first time that they're flying and they're flying at night and there's the danger, but you're conquering nature in a way. So there's this whole romanticism that goes along with it and the earnestness of it and the seriosity, the, the, the being so serious about it and dedicating your existence to something that you have decided is a greater cause. Now, we can agree or not that it was a greater cause. That's besides the point. The point is that this perfume and Jacques Guerlain's idea of that book that inspired him to create this perfume is more about the point of the thought process of the pilot who sacrifices their life for what they believe is a greater cause. That's what this smells of. It's, it's earnest. It takes itself seriously. It has a very clear structured moral. This perfume has a moral. Um, and believe it or not, as I said at the beginning of my review, it does smell dated. It doesn't smell dated because it smells of perfumes that our grandmothers and grandfathers used to wear. No, it smells dated because it still has a moral. Um, a lot of things today just don't have a moral today or the moral is just totally messed up. Like there's a moral, but it's not really a moral. Nowadays, just like politicians, they just kind of like the wind blows, the politician blows and it just blows for the rest of us to have to deal with those idiots. This one smells dated because it smells of a moral that is long gone. You know those days when the word of your fellow human being meant something, when somebody actually gave you their word, a gentleman or a gentle lady gave you their word, you knew that they were going to follow through with their word. Well, that doesn't happen today. Okay, today everybody's sketchy and flaky. Today somebody tells you, I promise I'll do it. Ah, uh, girl, I forgot. Yeah, I didn't care. Whatever, I'll do it some other time. Today you got to have a contract, non-disclosure agreement, double contract. If you get married, you need a um, prenup agreement, everything. Ha and then still they're going to try to mess with you. Then you got to like take a lawyer, pay a lawyer, run after them, say, hey, but you signed the contract. Then they're going to try to counter that and say, yeah, but the clause that you put in that contract wasn't very clear, so I'm going to counter sue. There's no more noble gestures today of take my word for it and then people believe you. It doesn't exist. Take my word doesn't exist anymore. This, however, smells of the time when, when somebody said, take my word for it, you could believe them. That's why it smells dated, because it smells of how it felt to actually trust in someone, to actually believe that someone will follow through with their promise, to actually feel that there is some sort of infrastructure that can support us, sustain us. This smells of trust, belief, 
and following through with one's word. It's a very rare thing. And to, and I think Jacques Guerlain, more than just a, a, a chemical person who could chemically construct a perfume, value, he was a poet. Because how can you put the concept of trust and earnestness into a perfume and make it smell of something? That's what, I mean, he's a genius. He's a genius. He made that emotion smell like something. This thing belongs in a museum because it's just that pure. And today, the, the, whatever politicians say, we don't believe them. Whatever the government says on the, on the news, we don't believe them. Health insurance is terrible. Some countries you have it and some countries you don't have it. Heaven forbid you were to get sick. Your country is going to abandon you. I've had people from my family die in, in the VA, okay? You serve your country. You come back home. Your government says, ah, we don't need you anymore. Bye, boo. You're forgotten. There is no more moral, okay? Everybody's the devil today. And uh, we are living in such sad times. Such sad times, okay? To smell something like this, that smells of better time. Yes, the 30s were terrible. We were right about to start a new war, okay? It wasn't easy either. But there was a... It, but for the happy moments that were still happy, there was structure and integrity there. That even on a smaller scale, even if it was just in the neighborhood, even if it was just with your own neighbors, with, with uh, building up a community, you don't have nowadays. Nowadays, you live in a building with the neighbors. You don't know their names. You don't know who they are. You don't know what they do for a living. You barely say hello to them when you meet them on the street or when you pass them by in the corridors. Like, heaven forbid you were to exchange two friendly words with them. That don't exist. Get out of my way, bitch. I got stuff to do. I don't have time for this. That's the sadness of it all. But the beauty, again is that Jacques delivered something so gorgeous like Vol de Nuit that doesn't smell of the book <laughs> or of flying in airplanes or what have you, but it smells of the moral, a moral compass that delivers emotions to you, that makes you feel safe. It makes you feel a part of a community that you really actually want to be a part of. It's a wonderful perfume. Now, let me get to a couple of uh, visuals here. So, um, hold on. Sorry. Uh, I also wanted to say, 1932, the book was translated into English by Stuart Gilbert, or Gilbert, I think Gilbert, as Night Flight, and was made a book of the month club choice in the United States. In the following year, Saint-Exupéry's friend Jacques Guerlain, they were friends, used the book's title as the name for his scent, Vol de Nuit. The bottle was a blend of glass and metal, an Art Deco style with a propeller motif. Now, hold on, you guys. I'm going to show you a couple of, of images. And, uh, okay, so this is not the order in which I wanted these. So this is the wrong order. Okay. All right, I'll have to improvise, you guys. So uh, this is the first edition cover of the book, Night Flight, British uh, edition. Um, let me see the next photo. It's going to be a surprise what's coming up next. Okay, so here is the Vol de Nuit uh, cover of the book. We have Saint-Exupéry. We got the pilot and uh, the airplane. This, this cover really describes. But what I love this 30s touch to the design of this. And I'm giving you these covers because I want you to feel the aesthetic of the times as well. Let me, let me show you the next picture. I wonder which one it's going to be. Okay, so this was supposed to be the first picture, but it's the third picture. So we have this de delicate, difficult flight of the plane at night about to crash because the mountains and the snow and the tragedy of it all. And that's also captured here in this beautiful uh, art piece for the cover of the book. So you see how many different scenes of the book, 
how many different inspirations the authors of the actual artwork for the cover of the book were inspired by the book to create. There's all these, and this is also a beautiful uh, one. I hope the next one is going to be. No, it's the wrong one again. Okay, so this one is the bottle of uh, the pure perfume of Vol de Nuit, which has been re-released uh, as of late. So you can actually buy it now. I don't know if it's limited or not, but this is a 30 milliliter pure perfume of Vol de Nuit. So this is a beautiful 30s Art Deco style where you see the glass bottle is reminiscent of a propeller and they, they use the blend of glass and metal. So the Volden We circle in the middle is supposed, to remin is supposed to be reminiscent of the propeller of a plane. And the stopper is made in metal as if it were a gear of the propeller of the plane. So there's that whole aesthetic of how they connected Art Deco with perfume and a book all in one bottle. Coincidentally, I was just watching The Muppet Show the other day, and I realized that on Miss Piggy's Muppet Show from the 70s and 80s, when Jim Henson was still alive, before Walt Disney royally messed up and killed the Muppets. Yes, Disney, you did them dirty. Miss Piggy, in the time when Frank Oz was still the voice of Miss Piggy and Jim Henson was still the king of the Muppets as he was, Miss Piggy's dressing room table in the Muppet Show, <coughs> had this bottle on it. That's how elegant the Muppets really are. Disney, take a clue, will ya? This is how it's done. Jim Henson gave Miss Piggy the best. Jim Henson put Vol de Nuit, the pure perfume, on Miss Piggy's dressing room table in the Muppet Show. Let me go to the next photo. Old school advertisement campaign for Volden We We got Shalimar. We got, um, is it Mitsuko? Or Lor Bleu. I can't see it too far away. And then a perfume that has been discontinued since. Oh, wait, I have it here, you guys. Lor Bleu, uh, the pure perfume. You can see how the original bottle by Raymond Guerlain was designed. This is the Eau de Toilette version now. There was a perforation here. So the whole little tying up uh, happened throughout that hole. And then we have Soulevant is that little bottle that's been discontinued with the little uh, edges um, there. Okay, so let me see what the next, <laughs> it's a surprise for me. What's the next one? This is a 2011 edition with a pump sprayer of Vol de Nuit. This has been discontinued since, but you can see how Guerlain tries to reinvent the fragrance, give it new life from time to time. There was this special edition in 2011. So it's like Guerlain is trying to keep the legacy alive of Old Nuit, good for them. And there should be maybe one more photo. This is the one that was supposed to be shown third. This is my preferred version of the cover of the book because it shows us, it's about delivering letters through night flights. And I love the fact that we have these old school letter envelopes with the red, white, and blue little stripes on the side. And the envelope is open. It's so poetic. And inside you have the sky and you have the dangerous uh, snowy mountain peaks and the, and, and the plane just kind of flying out of that envelope. This is the most poetic of the covers, I have to say. It's my favorite. And it also kind of a little bit encapsulates the smell of the perfume because the perfume does have that from the aldehydes, it, that sense of envelope of, of white paper. And then as, it, as, the, as the perfume opens, you have that beautiful airy, airy blue misty sky enveloping you. And uh, it's a fuzzy, fluffy feeling of, of abandoning yourself to the night. So that, that's the beauty of this cover. I think this cover is beautiful both for the book concept as well as for the perfume concept. So I think that's it for the photos. <clears throat> um, and, uh, and now let's get to the kind of a little bit tragic aspect of the, of the perfume review. Um, longevity. Tragic. Not even an hour. Really, really tragic. Um, I have not smelt the current pure perfume formulation. Um, 
So I can't tell you if that one has a little bit better longevity. Projection, also quite tragic. Stays very close to the skin. It's a very intimate, personal scent. So is it worth the money? It, it's a beautiful fragrance, even in this watered-down version of itself. But treat it as a cologne. Take it with you. Put it in your bag and keep respraying all day long because this one does not last a minute on your skin. Now, in, in terms of the travel and the journey it takes me on, I already told you before, it's a, it's a very clear concept of moral. So that's why I also feel it's fine in this watered-down state because that type of moral of trusting when somebody gives you their word, trusting that they will deliver on that word, that concept in our society is fading. We have less and less of that. That's why this one is also fading. So I feel like it's fine that it's watered down. It just shouldn't cost as much, being that it's so watered down. Gerla, Gerla, I'm sure you can do better than what you're doing with this. Um, but even in its watered down state, I still love it to bits. I can already barely smell it now. If I warm it up, I, I do this trick sometimes. I tell you guys in a lot of my reviews, I blow through my nostrils hot air onto the spot of the skin where I spray the perfume. That's why you kind of unlock the molecules more. <laughs> mm. And then it's a divine when you do that. But you kill the perfume. By doing that, you get four or five sniffs out of it, then it's dead. <laughs> but it's worth it. It's worth the sniffing. Um, and when I do the warm-up, it's a lot of Narcissus for me, Iris, Violet, and Carnation. And Sandalwood. There's a typical sandalwood that they're using, a synthetic sandalwood that they also use in the current version of um, Samsara. It's the same chemical that they're using, the same synthetic substitute for sandalwood that they use for Samsara is uh, also in Voldenui. And I smell that out very clearly when I warm up the spot where I, where I sprayed it on my skin. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful concept of a moral from times long gone. There you have it. Uh, let me see what you guys say. Velasquez says, Eau de toilette, wear it on clothes. I, it, it, would, it would project a bit longer if you put it on clothes, but still, I tried it on clothes as well. It doesn't last that much. Velasquez says, Parfum is way better and lasts 12 hours. Velasquez, are you talking about the current version of the Parfum? or the old version. Olfactive says the current pure perfume smells different, really green, more Narcissus, I believe with a gorgeous vanilla behind, sprayed it on paper, but in my jacket pocket and got the smell of it for two weeks. Yeah, but we're, we're talking about what happens on the skin, you know, you know. Uh, Jam says, which one is the biblical meaning or the servant one? Uh, what are we talking about here? Uh, um, Gary says, ah, the old paravion enveloped. Yes, with the, the envelopes with the little stripes, the green, the, the blue, red, and white ones. Olfactor Story says, ah, this is the scented powder on this picture. I don't know which one of the pictures you're talking about, but definitely that picture does smell of scented powder. <laughs> Olfactor Story says, Oh, yeah, Jam says, Walt Disney is dodgy. Yes. Uh, Jam also asked, what gender was this marketed towards? Olfactive says, no gender, I believe. This is part of the classic ones, great for men and women. Back in the day, I'm not so sure if it was uh, targeted towards men or women, but I can tell you already from a lot of tales and people writing about this perfume, uh, already back then, a lot of men wore uh, Voldenui, because Voldenui was associated to the book, and the book was associated to these men who had value. These men who were pilots, pilots back then were the highest form of if you, you were a real man, you know, and then the perfume came out with the same title of the book. Yeah, of course, men wore Voldenui. Still to this day, you have a lot of gentlemen telling you that they wear Voldenui. So, Voldenui 
might have been perhaps targeted to ladies, but it, it was definitely a unisex, if there ever was a unisex perfume, and you know I always say all oh, perfumes know no gender, this was, this was one of them. Even though you see that Volden Wee 2011 ad that I showed you, there was a woman on the ad, it was targeted to women, at least in 2011, but I would say this one is very, very unisex, you guys, you know. Uh, Gary says the original Guerlain bottles are gorgeous. Mr. Phillips says uh, the backstory is quite masculine. I'm curious of how the masculine mixes with the feminine. Uh, Marlene Dietrich herself was one of the first to play with gender in the mainstream. This is a very fascinating perfume. It doesn't really go male or female it's it's its own moral it's a moral it's a, it smells of moral <laughs> jesus says uh, the original bottle is gorgeous it is really really beautiful i remember smelling it for the first time ever and falling in love with it instantly i should definitely get a bottle says jesus Olfactive says the eau de toilette is gorgeous too. Mr. Philip Eblis says, I am sold. I'm going to track this one down and get it. Olfactive says, I just love it. I'm planning to get the extract version in that beautiful bottle for my birthday. Yes, I am hunting down the pure perfume as well. Just uh, figuring a couple of things because it ain't cheap, you guys. It's 30 milliliter Guerlain pure perfume. You know, they come at a price. This is one of my favorite fragrances for spring, says Olfactive Stories. This is a good point to end it on. Uh, what time of the year is this one good for? It's good all year round. This one, this one is so wonderful in, in winter, in spring, in summer, in fall. There's nuances to it. No Guerlain fragrance is linear. All of them go through a transformation. It's always a cathartic process when you're wearing Guerlain. You start at one point, you end somewhere else. So. By being so complex, their perfumes really go on different trajectories and different journeys on your skin according to the seasons you're wearing them in. And they do smell slightly nuanced differently according to the time of year you're wearing them. So this one is really beautiful. It evolves. It evolves through the seasons. It's really great. It's really, really great. Thank you guys so much for watching. Until next time, never forget to never give up on love. Love you all. See you soon. Take care. Bye. Let's fly together this night with Walden Week.